right, check, check. How are you guys doing tonight? Great, great. Well, welcome to Young Professionals on this beautiful, hot Tuesday night. Why does summer have to start so early? Lord, <laughs> Lord, you're killing me. <laughs> what we guys, we're going to do now, guys, just get into a little bit of worship. So if you guys don't mind, go ahead and stand up on your feet. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole
atmosphere is changing now. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. And the Spirit of
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for tonight, Jesus. Thank you for giving us this space here to worship you without any worry of worshiping you, Jesus. Thank you for the people that are in this room. They're here for a reason, not by chance. Thank you, God, for your love and who you are. Thank you, Jesus, that you gave us all breath this morning to wake up and continue doing your work here on earth. Father, I ask that as we go throughout tonight, Father, that our, our ears are open, our hearts are open, our minds are open to whatever's going to be taught here tonight. Jesus, so we can take that and apply that in our lives at all moments in time, God. For your spirit here is here, Jesus. Overflow in this place and let it flood our hearts. We thank you, Jesus. We love you, and we pray this in your precious name. Amen. And now please welcome up our announcer. Clearly she is the coolest thing since ice cream, Laura Oropesa. Hey, hey, let's give it up for our worship team. Woo! They're awesome, 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 awesome. Welcome, young professionals, Scott Stale. So excited to be here tonight. I am looking forward to tonight. Tonight's going to be an awesome message. Um, I look forward to every Tuesday now. It's like super exciting. I used to look forward to it because it was Taco Tuesday. Now I'm like, hey, young professional Tuesday. Um, <laughs> so welcome. A little bit about young professionals. If you don't know about us, we are a community of um, young professionals, 20s and 30s. Um, we do life together. Um, we just have fun and we have table discussions and um, we do fun social events, service projects, all that good stuff. Um, this community has changed my life, like completely changed my life. Three years ago, I was a huge mess and now I'm like, whoo, restored. Only God can do that, right? Um, so we are intentional, intentional about prayer, um, relationships, um, community, discipleship, serving, um, intentional is like our word, and we do it with excellence. So welcome, welcome. If you're new, please fill out the connect cards on your tables. Um, fill it out so we can get to know you a little bit better, follow up with you, call you, welcome you back. Um, so please fill that out. Um, a few announcements. Game night is coming up on May 19th. It is out in Chandler. So um, I know if you live down here, um, you can still drive up there, but hey, you're still invited. We are looking forward to having more social events down here in Scottsdale, so stay tuned to that, for that. Um, we actually have some life groups starting up on Sunday mornings at 1030 here at the Scottsdale campus, so if you come to this campus, definitely get plugged into the life groups that are going to start happening on May 20th at 1030 a.m., um, led by Brian, and just stay connected with more of our, um, stay connected on our social media so you can stay tuned for all of that. Um, let's see what else. Oh, our Facebook private group page. So if you have not already um, asked to join into the pri private group page, um, you have to ask to get joined in, but you'll answer a few questions and we'll get you linked in and you'll be able to ask for prayer or um, meet up for others, meet up with others for coffee, um, get, just get encouraging messages and just meet up with people. That's what it's for. So just organic um, meetups and it's just for community, it's for all of you. 
Um, and yeah, stay connected. Follow us on social media. If you do not already, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter at CS Young Pros. Um, and then turn off the notification, turn on the notifications so you get notified. Um, yeah. So E already prayed us in. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and welcome Seth up on stage as he is teaching um, us tonight and teaching the message tonight. And uh, yeah, just have an open heart for this message. So, um, thanks so much, Laura. Thank you. All right, E, I'm gonna stand that right there. Okay, welcome, welcome. I'm uh, covering for Morrow tonight. He's Traveling. Actually, I'm going to come down. This is a thought that I had since I've been coming here. Let's come down to the people. Come down, come down to where the rest of us are at, right? Down here. Water's warm. It's nice down here. You feel it? You feel it? It's good. All right. So, all right. So, 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 gosh, where to start? We're in week five. We're in week five of six with... Uh, the Last Arrow, and this is a book uh, that we've been going through. For those that, that are new or uh, just joining in uh, again after a little while, uh, we're in week five of six of The Last Arrow, which is a, a series that's based on a book by Ir Irwin McManus. And so let me catch you up on uh, the first few weeks so we kind of know where we're at. So first week, we introduced the concept of uh, striking the last arrow. This is what the whole book's based on. And what this was is, is a story about Elisha. He's a prophet. There's a king that comes to him and says, I need your help. We're being defeated. We're, we're about to go under. Uh, God tells the prophet to tell the king a couple things. Um, fire an arrow out. It's, it, and he tells him certain things about certain things. The last thing he tells him to do. <laughs> you know what? The details are for week one. So <laughs> review that message if you want to go back to uh, that. Read chapter one of the book. Um, but the, the important part was the striking of the arrows, which is the last part of that. Was there heckling when Morrow's up here? I don't think so. <laughs> so with that part, um, the, the king was supposed to strike the arrows. Now, the prophet didn't say how many times, and the king didn't necessarily know that, but he stopped at three. And kind of the implication as we go through the, the course of the story and really dig deep is that he quit. Like, he, he's, he stopped short of what God truly wanted to do in that moment. Uh, and... Uh, it ended up that the king was hamstrung by that. He was not able to go past three victories with his enemies. And so that ended up being defeat at the end. And so living with that sense of urgency that um, to keep striking those errors until there's nothing left, save nothing for the next life. That is the subtitle of the book, that we live a life with no regrets. Week two, uh, I was talking about setting your past on fire. This is a very graphic um, description that, that uh, McManus uh, goes through where we take even, even the good things of, about our past and say, and leave it for, and say, say, for, say things for what they are, that this was a good point in my life, this was a bad point in my life, but it was a point in my life, and I'm now past it. I'm now moving forward. And yes, I was maybe shaped by those things, I've been hurt by those things, but those things actually don't matter moving forward in this sense. When, when God's calling you forward, take those steps out, leave the past behind. Paul actually talks about in the New Testament uh, to... Uh, leave the past and reach ahead. He actually talks about reaching out uh, towards what's in front of you as, as you're on this race. Uh, and so, yeah, there's, there's really just, at that point, no reason to look back because it's all about where you're at right now and where you're going. And so McManus really uh, implores us to set that past on fire, just burn it up so that it's not even something that we ever look back to when we need to be keeping our uh, head forward. Uh, week three was refusing to stay behind. And so... Uh, there's a point where Elisha is, is following around his mentor, um, Elijah, and uh, Elijah keeps telling him, stay here in this town, stay here in this town, and Elijah says, I will not leave you, I will not leave you. This is going to play into this week. He says, I will not leave you. All the other prophets are like, yeah, we're going to hang out here at home, uh, but, but Elisha says, I will not leave you. And that's where he ends up getting this incredible blessing, this double blessing, because he stays with Elijah all the way through. He pushes through and stays by his side and says, no, I want to live the life you're living in the place where you are with God. And, and says, that's where I'm committing my life to. So don't stay behind. Uh, and then stand your ground. This was a powerful one from last week. Um, I, I love Morrow just emphasizing that phrase over and over again. Um, we're going to have a, a phrase this week as well. Um, but standing your ground, we've talked about these heroes, these uh, mighty men 
who in battle, everyone fled, but they stayed. There's just something that they knew about what God could do. Uh, there was just something uh, uh, possible in the impossible that they, that they knew in their heart of hearts. Even if they were scared, they were going to stand there, and they were going to stand their ground, and they were going to win because they knew God had asked them to do that, had called them to stand right there. And so when it comes to the things that God is calling us into in our life, he's asking us to stand our ground, to stay there no matter what obstacles are in our way, no matter what comes against us. If he's calling us forward, keep going forward. Again, burn that past. Um, don't stay behind and stand your ground uh, when you need to, uh, when things get tough. So this day, we are going to today, <laughs> this day, <laughs> I'm working on this. I'm working on this public speaking thing. <laughs> uh, today, today, we are going to uh, talk about finding your tribe. That's the title of uh, the message today. And I love this uh, part of the book because this part so connects with how I'm made to be. I, I have an INFJ, INFJ, ENFJ, uh, Myers-Briggs personality, right? And one of the things about that personality type is that I go deep in relationships. I have not a bunch of shallow relationships. I have just a few deep relationships. And that's part of what I thrive on. It, I've, I've got to be connected with people, and I need them to be connected with me. And that's just part of how I'm built. And so um, we're going to find out just how that important that is actually for all of us um, today as we go through our lesson. So uh, the phrase that... McManus uh, uses for this chapter that, that really stands out is you will never accomplish anything, you will never accomplish everything God has created you to do alone. Let me read that again. You will never accomplish everything God has created you to do alone. So I want to throw that out there just real quick and see if you agree or if you disagree with that because that's, that's a bold statement to say you're not, in this sense, you're not enough. What do you think about that? Agree? Why? Okay, I like it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, we each bring something to the table. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yes. So, since we're recording this, I'll repeat that. So we need, um, what was the first one? If, if, you can do it yourself, if you can do it yourself, we don't need God. You need community because each person brings uh, certain gifts to the table that, that are unique to that person and can be used together. And then, I'm sorry, Justin, what was your last one? No. God works in and through people. That's, that's great. So one of the, the important points is if, if you can do it yourself, your vision is too small because God works in his realm. He works in a place that is so much bigger than us. So for, yeah, so for every name that is known, there's an endless number of names that are unknown. So McManus says it like this. We've been misled to believe that if we have the potential for greatness within us, we don't need help to accomplish this greatness. And so, uh, yeah, we, sorry, let me read that one more time. We've been misled to believe that if, we, that if we have the potential for greatness within us, we don't need people to help us accomplish that greatness. And so I think we think about that a lot of times when we think about uh, sports heroes. We see uh, a Michael Jordan. We see a Tom Brady. We see people who are... Uh, the ones that stand out from the team, and, and we hold them up as these, these heroes, or, or like a boxer, you think of boxers, there's like two on the bill, but you don't think about their managers. Uh, with, in football and basketball, a lot of the times you really don't think about the team. When you remember the great victory, you remember who the, the leading point scorer was um, in that scenario. Let's, um, and then, I'm sorry. I got my notes all out of order. In my life, uh, this is also true. In achievements uh, that I had in my life, when it, let's say, it came to school, I did really well in school, but a lot of that was because my dad came home every night after working a long day and then sat down with me and did the craziest chemistry, trigonometry, um, you know, algebra, whatever 
uh, homework with me uh, in order to just help me get through her, you know, would look over my papers after I wrote them, just do some edits on them or whatever. And it was, I couldn't have done that by myself. I was, I was still learning. I had friends who did endless nights of reviewing, reviewing flashcards before tests um, or at work. Uh, any accomplishments I've had there, any ones that I would hold out were because I had uh, an intern team working with me uh, or an assistant uh, who just rocked it uh, alongside me. And that's the way we did uh, things. And so it's, for me, it's always about working on this team. And it's because you will never accomplish everything God has created you to do alone. So let's uh, kind of break out of this and go to uh, a story that's going to show us who came alongside David. Because David, I think, we're going to see, you're gonna, we're going to be reading in 1 Samuel 20. So if you want to prepare that. We're going to look and see uh, what David's, um, uh, somebody key in, in David's life. And so if there's ever a success story, it was him. He ends up being the king that is held up in the highest esteem to this day um, by the people of Israel, by the Jewish people. And he went from basically being a shepherd boy, if you remember the story of David and Goliath, he was a shepherd boy, um, to defeating Goliath, having the prophet, who's, who's God's voice on earth, say, you're going to be king, when there was already a king. So this is kind of a problem. And that person who then ended up having the problem, his name is Saul. And so the twist in this whole story, on top of everything, and the fact that he's been called to be king, there already is a king, and he hates him, and he wants him dead, is that that king has a son who loves David, who's actually uh, his best friend. And so this makes it super awkward. How many people have had a best friend whose dad wanted them dead? Anyone? It's a, it's a, rough, it's a rough place to be. Uh, I haven't had it, but I just, I guessed that that was probably not cool. So let's look at uh, Samuel 21 through 25. I'm going to one of these and read it here. So what I'm going to do is, we have a bit of, bit of reading here, but if you bear with me, we'll, we'll kind of break it down so we kind of understand what's going on. 1 Samuel 20, verse 1. Then David fled from Naoth to Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, what have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he is trying to kill me? Never, Jonathan replied, you are not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything, great or small, without letting me know. Why would he hide this from me? It isn't so. So Jonathan's having a problem believing that uh, his father is capable of this. And David's like, listen up, buddy. Uh, but David took an oath and said, your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he will be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there's only a step between me and death. Jonathan said to David, whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. And that's a good one to underline right there. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. We're going we're gonna to circle back to that one. So Jonathan says, uh, David says, look, Saul probably knows that you're going to tell me anything, uh, and especially this, so he's going to hold back from you. So David said, in verse 5, David said, look, tomorrow is the new moon feast. I am supposed to dine with the king, but let me go and hide in the field until the evening of the day after tomorrow. If your father misses me at all, tell him, David earnestly asked my permission to hurry to Bethlehem, his hometown, because an annual sacrifice is being made there for his whole clan. If he says, very well, then your servant is safe. But if he loses his temper, you can be sure that he is determined to harm me. For as you know, for us, I'm sorry, as for you, show kindness to your servant, for you have brought him into a covenant, for you have brought him into a covenant with you before the Lord. If I am guilty, then kill me yourself. Why hand me over to your father? So David says, is, uh, believes that this whole thing is a setup, that, that uh, Saul knows where he's going next, and he's actually laying in wait to kill him. And so he says, well, let's test this. I'm going to change my plans at the last minute. You're going to tell him, and if he gets really upset, then we'll know. We'll know that he had other plans for him. <laughs> and then he says, you know, if this is, if I'm wrong, well, actually, if I'm right, uh, if I'm guilty, then kill me yourself. 
yeah, why hand me over your father? Because he just, he doesn't want to die that way. It's like, I'd rather die by you, Jonathan. Jonathan says, never, in verse 9, if I had the least inkling that my father was determined to harm you, wouldn't I tell you? David asked, who will tell me if your father answers you harshly? Come, Jonathan said, let's go into the field. So they went there together. Then Jonathan said to David, I swear by the Lord, the God, the God of Israel, that I will surely sound out my father by this time of the day tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. He is favor if he is favorably disposed toward you, will I not send you word and let you know? But if my father intends to harm you, may the Lord deal with Jonathan, be it ever so severely. If I do not let you know and send you away in peace, may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. But show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live, so that I may not be killed, and do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan's going to find out for him, and he says, okay, look, if, if this all pans out at the end of the day and you end up becoming king, please don't hold this against me. If, if my father truly wants to kill you, don't hold this against us and, and kill our whole family, which is basically what was done back in the time to keep any of those people from ever rising up against the king again. Uh, so Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him, because he loved him as he loved himself. So there's, uh, there's a, a covenant, not just, a, hey, I promise I'm going to do this for you. A covenant was just, it was so much deeper. It was, um, a lot of the times they would seal these things in blood. Uh, they would cut both of their hands and then mix their, their blood together. So it was like un, unmixable. <laughs> What's, what's the word for that? Can't separate it. Uh, can't separate it back out. It was intercommingled um, blood some of these uh, times when they did these covenants. So again, the phrase is, you will never accomplish everything God has created you to do alone. If you think back to Stand Your Ground, we learned about the three. We learned about David's mighty warriors. And, and the thing about the, the mighty warriors is that when they accomplished what they did, who still got the credit at the end of the day with the battle? It was still David. And then that's, again, that's the part about David's secret to success was the fact that he had that group. So when we come, when it comes down to us, when we start to think about who, who are those people who, who, ri who raise us up on their shoulders, it really begs, it starts to beg these questions. And, I, and I'm going to ask a series of questions that are going to help us us dig down uh, into our life to see like who these people are in our life. So the first set of questions uh, that I don't want us to miss is, which friendships do you believe in? I love that, the depth of that question. It's not just who are your friends. It's which friendships do you believe in? Who are the people that can believe in your friendship? Another way to look at it is, who is with you, and who are you with? Who is your team? So the example that we have of the, t the quality of person, the type of person we're looking here, and the, the quality of that relationship, and that, that belief in each other, the, the depth of that is what we see with Jonathan and David. So if we think of all that, that David accomplishes in his life, unifying Israel, conquering Jerusalem uh, from the Philistines, taking it back, for his people, defeating five different enemies, the Malachites, the Philistines, the Moabites, the Syrians, the Ammonites, setting up a dynasty that, in his bloodline that would lead all the way to Jesus. This is, this is what David ends up doing. How does he do this? And it's with people like the mighty men. It's like, it's like having, uh, it's, it's having people like Jonathan in his life. So let's look at, back to the verses again, Three of the things that, that Jonathan exemplified in this, this friendship. Um, in uh, the, the first one is verse 4. He says, whatever you want me to do, I will do it. I will do for you. So Jonathan is willing to sacrifice everything. He's willing to sacrifice his life. He's willing to sacrifice his plans. I guess we should probably flip that. <laughs> his plans his, up to his life uh, for David. Because he knows, he knows that God has his hand on David's life. And Jonathan says, there's nothing that I want in this life. Because Jonathan was next in line for the throne. One of the things he doesn't acknowledge was, hey, if my father dies, it should be me. 
that's king. Jonathan never raises that point, at least in, in this passage, with David saying, you know, I know this is supposed to be mine, but I know God has this for you. He never even considers it because he knows. He knows God and he knows what God's doing in David's life. And he attaches himself to David and said, no, it's about you. Number two, verse 16, he made a covenant. And this wasn't out of convenience. It was an all-in commitment. And this is one of the biggest words that, that we millennials have such a hard time with and that uh, when it comes to this, this topic of your tribe and your group that we have uh, will really uh, hang us up. And that is the level of commitment, of having this all-in commitment. You're not able to... Um, make this covenant, make such a deep connection without being able to have an all-in commitment. Verse 17 says, he loved him as he loved himself. So now this goes past just a friendship of convenience. It goes past, oh, hey, uh, we just happen to live in the same town together or on the same street or we uh, work at the same job or we fought in the same battle. This is, this is love. This, this goes to the point of friendship, a relationship. I'm pinning everything on this person. We, we live and die together. We breathe together. Um, so how do you live the life you were created to live? One of the best ways to identify where we're going is to identify who we're going with. And one of the best predictors of your future is the people that you choose to be in your tribe. Uh, when we're wondering about what we're going to look like and who we're going to become, uh, Jim Rohn, a, a leadership author, says we become, we're the average of the five closest people in our life. So you think about that. Start thinking about some of those people who you're close to and, and think about, you know, we have those Snapchat filters, right, Where, that, that we can, like, do a face swap or, like, see what it looked like. We had someone's, like, ears on our head and all that kind of thing. But think about that in, term, in, a, in, a, in a greater way with the people that are in our life. What if we had all of bits and pieces and traits of the various friends that we hang out with, that we see all the time, that are always there for us. Is that, that amalgamation, is that the person that we want to be? Is that who we want to become? Think about that. There's probably some good things in there. There's probably some bad things in there. But at the end of the day, it is about those people. So one of the things is, uh, as, as you think about your life, you hang out with friends uh, who like dancing, actually. I borrowed uh, some of uh, tomorrow's notes here. He was talking about there's a lot of people in this group that like to dance. And guess what? If you hang around those people long enough, you're going to be dancing along with them, probably quite a lot. You hang out with people who like going out to eat. Guess what? You're probably going to be going out to eat quite a bit. But what would happen if you surrounded yourself with people who are dreamers? What would happen if you surrounded yourself with people who are faithful and full of faith and who constantly have their sights set on God and tomorrow. What is, what is that like to be around and what would you become being around those people? There's an analogy in the book um, that really talks about working towards something together and it's, uh, Ern McManus says, we're all in a boat uh, rowing, you and, and the people that you're with, your, your tribe, if you will. And we need to make sure that we're all rowing in the same direction I don't know if you've ever um, been in a situation where you're in a group of people and uh, I don't know if you remember like a, a school trip or something where you like had to go out in a group of like four people or whatever and every last person wants to go a different direction. I want to go here. I want to go see this. Oh, I'm hungry. I want to go over here. I want to go here. One, you probably don't end up going anywhere for about 45 minutes because you're all arguing about what you should do next. Uh, or if you're in the same boat, that boat is just going probably in circles like this, not actually going down the stream. So it's so important that the boat that you're in, in order to actually go anywhere, has to be, you have to be rowing the same direction. It's a sign of maturity at the end of the day. Um, being intentional about who you choose to be in your life, to not let it just happen, not just to go with the flow and just end up in a group of people. And so I can see your future um, through the people that are around you. And if you there's a, there's a quote uh, in the book that says, if you want to go fast, this is a, he's quoting this, this African uh, proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I think he actually argues later on, he's like, if you have the right people, you can actually go fast and far together. 
So again, some more of these questions we can ask yourself. Who do you care about and who cares about you? Who are the people in your life that you pray for and who's praying for you? Who have you committed your life to? And who's committed their life to you? Who do you need in your life? And who needs you in their life? Because there are some people who you need to pull into your tribe because you're actually in a place where you, you need to pull people to where you're at because you've gotten down uh, a path in your faith. You've gotten down a path in your life where you made some mistakes, but you've gotten to a good place. Who are the people that you need to actually bring in to your world so that they can be in that place together because at the end of the day as much as we've been talking about us 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 and the people we surround ourselves with this isn't about us it's about being a part of this greater whole because all those people in your tribe that's their tribe too and so basically those people are going to help help you achieve your dreams and you're going to help them achieve their dreams a tribe is a, a family it's love, it's acceptance, it's belonging, it's protection, it's strength in numbers. It's formidable in a fight. Imagine going in a fight with like 10 people behind you versus just you by yourself. It teaches us and trains us up. And it never leaves us behind. You will never accomplish everything God has created you to do alone. So what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, go into our uh, discussion groups, and we're going to look at some of the questions for this week, kind of see how this kind of applies in our life. So one of the things uh, that I'd love to have happen is a table leader, just to take down some notes um, so that afterwards uh, we, can, we can get back together and just kind of talk about some of the cool things uh, that we talked about at our table. So we'll do that for about the next 20 minutes. All right, guys. I hope we've solved everything about finding the right people in our life right now. Because we have like 20 minutes, right? No. All right, so let's, uh, let's go through, let's go through uh, some of those questions and kind of go around the room and get a sense of uh, what people are thinking here. So what stands out to you? Anybody, anybody can uh, answer. We'll bring a mic around just because we're recording this, and then that way everybody can hear. What stands out to you about the friendship between Jonathan and David? Over here, Rachel. <laughs> At our table, we said it's rare. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Rare. What makes it so rare? What do, you, what do you think makes it, makes it so rare? What's so hard about having a relationship like that? He was willing to be so selfless in this friendship. Yes. Like you said, he was supposed to be king, and he doesn't ever really mention that because he sees God's anointing on David. Right. Um, I don't know that a lot of people would will be willing to give up, you know, being king because they have a good friend, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's a big one. It's rare. It is. It's inspiring. Anybody else? Um, we mentioned how, uh, you know, they're, they're really committed to each other. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a very strong love, like a brotherly love. Yes. Uh, between them. And, you know, Jonathan was even kind of willing to semi-turn his back on his father for David. That's how close yep. they were. Um, yep. That he was, you know, felt like, you know, it was pretty much like family mm -hmm. at that point. So. Yeah. That's something that we noticed. Anybody else? Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a special relationship, um, and it, it kind of sets that standard for what some of those types of, and, and again, this isn't just with anybody. Uh, we can't possibly have these kinds of friendships with everybody, but there is, there is that small group, that, that most influential group, the, the group that we're most vulnerable with that we've opened ourselves up the most to, that we're the most connected with, that at the basic level, it does need to be unselfish. It does need to be um, in that way that 
that we can be so vulnerable so that because we know that other person has our best interests in mind, we have their best interests in mind, and that they're going to take care of us, we're going to take care of them. So next, next question is, behind every name uh, that, there's, that is known, there's an endless number of names that are unknown. Why do you think society worships the individual and forgets the teams? I think a lot of times um, we're just conditioned to like the the leader, the hero, all our stories, movies that we grow up watching or yeah. listening to or reading. It has that one hero that does everything and we want to emulate because we're like, that's super cool. So let's be like that person. Plus, it's kind of easier um, idolizing the individual versus a whole group of people. That's kind of exhausting. Yeah, <laughs> exactly so hard to be like, I want to be like all of them, but like in all of their individual ways, you know? <laughs> exactly. It's, and in fact, for, for the purposes of storytelling, um, characters in books, I mean, there only ends up being like a handful of characters in a book just to make it clear who's who, uh, because we can't, our brains just don't even work that way, right? We like to just look at the one person. Mm -hmm. Why do you think, uh, why do you think, I'm sorry, when you think, of some of your past successes, who were some of the people that contributed to them and maybe didn't get the credit? Anybody have some, some insight that they came up with as they thought about their life? Um, so something we were talking about in our table is that, um, for example, uh, we, like how looking, I had struggle writing when I was in high school and yeah. I graduated in 2016, I mean six, sorry, 16, six, <laughs> and I wish, uh, I know, right? Uh, but like there was a teacher, a particular teacher, writing teacher that, um, that pushed me, pushed me, pushed me to, you know, pass this test, do great. Now, years later, you know, I'm 29 now, I don't give credit to that person. It's like, look at my writing now yes. to, you know, this person, you know, pushed me to, you know, do so good that I, I still, you know, I still, he's always, I always think of him because, um, because that's something, someone that really put an impression on me, but I never say who, like, I wouldn't, like, it just, in, within me, I wouldn't talk about him, like, you know, and with everyone, oh, you know, but yeah, that's my, yeah. Never discount. Uh, the influence that you can have on somebody's life, uh, young, old, your peer, um, by even helping just a little bit in some area where that person needed some help. It's amazing how transformational that moment can be. And in your case, it, it changed, it's a domino effect, right? You, it, with the, the writing, it then allowed you to do better in all kinds of other areas of life, right? Because of that one area of, of help, and that person was sacrificing their time and their efforts to help you. And then now, what God has blessed us with is to, to then take that and pour that out into other people, and it just continues to, to pour out. Uh, this question here, agree or disagree and why? One of the best predictors of your future is the people you choose. I want to hear what you think about that that thought that we were talking about tonight. Yeah, maybe somewhere over here. All right. um, so this was one that we kind of got to towards the end, but mm -hmm. um, we, we just touched base a little bit on essentially the, uh, the influence that a group of people can have on your life. Um, I mean, we all know that you know, we're designed to be influenced by something, right? We, as humans, pick up something. We, I mean, we see it in children, right? They're, they're so like sponges, and we continue that path as humans throughout, throughout life, right? We pick up different things. So naturally, whoever is around you or whatever you're around, you're essentially going to become that particular thing, right? Um, I think one of the, the coolest things or the craziest things that, that Jesus gives us the best example of this concept of finding your tribe is one of the first things that he did when he started his ministry was find his tribe, right? He went around looking for people that were going to be influencers um, to other people, right? To be fisher of men. And so this concept of finding your tribe um, and 
having these people around you that are going to influence um, is a big thing, right? It's a big thing. It was a big thing to Jesus, so I think as Christians it would be a big thing to us, right? Um, this concept of community and being around people that are um, seeking the kingdom of God mm-hmm. and looking to push that agenda, right? And so um, clearly that's a big predictor of who you are and what you're influenced by, right? Because nobody does life by themselves, right? Mm-hmm. Nobody sits in a bubble those hamster balls and, you know, goes around and yeah. doesn't talk to anybody, right? Um, sure, you're going to have your moments where you're alone or where, you know, some people are more outgoing than others, but at the same time, you're still around people, right? And you're going to be influenced by that or influenced by something, right? Music, books, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. So um, needless to say, I definitely agree with who <laughs> who you hang with mm-hmm. is who you're going to become, right? Um, yeah, it's again, it's so important that 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 boat analogy. One, we are not meant to be in a little rowboat by ourselves, just trucking along. <laughs> That's that boat is is the one that is the first to get into trouble. Being in a big ship, we are all rowing. Um, you can row up some through some pretty good storms that way. Um, and and if you've ever seen uh, boat races, I I actually work near Tempe Town Lake, so I see. Um, the dragon boats and the uh, the canoe type things, I don't know what they're called, but the teams that are rowing out there, it's amazing when they're, as, when they're highly trained and they have somebody at the front who's directing their, their rhythms, how fast they can go and just how powerful they can get that boat from one side of that lake to the other um, when they're all working together. So just in closing, there's a... There's another character that we studied um, before in Young Professionals at, at our Chandler campus of, of Samson, and he's somebody who uh, was the opposite of David. He completely wasted his legacy. It was all about him. Uh, he surrounded himself with the worst people, um, and actually he truly didn't care about people at the end of the day. It was really all about him. Um, and David was the, the complete opposite uh, in this uh, scenario. He saw the power of this community around him, and one of the things I want to point out is if you're looking for that, because I, I think the question that ends up coming out of all of this is if you're in a place where it's like, okay, that sounds great, that sounds great, how do I do this? It's, it's to be in a place where you can learn how to be a friend and then be that friend. Because a lot of times we want people to approach us. We want people to seek us out for that friendship when really many times uh, instead of waiting, it's really about us learning how to become that friend for other people and then that friendship automatically forms and then we can get to that point where after developing a relationship when we realize hey we're on the same path together we can commit we can commit to them this place here young professionals is a community built by community it was almost literally a group of people who uh, through the course of the evolution of this ministry got together and said this is the culture this is what we want in this place is a place where people are welcome to come in to find uh, other people who are on that same path, who are on that same journey. Yes, we're all coming from different places in life, but you're where I want to go. You're where I was, and you can come with me. Um, you're in the same place where we can find each other and go through life together and be in community and encourage each other and be support supportive of each other. That was the group that started this group, and that's so powerful is they wanted to then have everybody else experience that same type of of life together. And that's exactly how the Bible describes that the body of Christ um, should be and should live together. And and that group of people is called the church. Um, It's not a building. It's that group of people in community. So remember this phrase. You will never accomplish everything God has created you to do alone. It very much is about finding your tribe in community, and I I hope and pray that um, if God's brought you here tonight, um, that you would continue to be a part of this community and just see, just see, get in that boat with other people that are, that are going down that, that path, that, uh, that river, and just see if that's going to take you uh, faster and farther than you ever thought before in your life. Thank you so much for coming tonight, and 
We'll see you next week. <laughs> next week. There was a question about that, but indeed, next week.